You said like 45 minutes, basically, yeah? yeah. Okay. And then questions after. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, uh, we, we can. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, whenever I started teaching, I was always kind of worried that I would never be able to fill up a full lecture for a given class. And the more that I do it now, it's, you know, I've run out of time. So it's just long-windedness takes practice, it turns out. No, I spent uh, like five or six years excavating at a small hilltop site right outside of Kiwi called Escalera al Cielo, the Stairway to Heaven. So it was kind of like an intermediate elite residential complex. Oh, what did you say? You mean it was? Pardon? Uh, it was, uh, uh, the site was called Escalera al Cielo. Key week. Oh, near Key Week. Mm-hmm. It was a suburb of Key Week. So I excavated there for like five years, and the reason why we spent so much time excavating there was because uh, the site showed signs of rapid abandonment with anticipated return. Oh. With, uh, so basically, excavation in almost every single house mound, elite, commoner, whatever, had on-floor assemblages. Um, pottery and stone tools that had been left on the floors. This is incredibly rare in Pook sites. Normally, the houses are totally cleared out, totally clean whenever they would abandon it. This type of discard uh, didn't appear to be like somebody was coming through and sacking the place. Um, but it wasn't like we had every single pot and stone tool that these people owned being found either. This tells us that perhaps they took some things with them whenever they left with the idea that they would come back later to pick that stuff up. So you call it a rapid abandonment but with anticipated return. If you're on a hilltop during a period of drought and your water cisterns are running dry, pretty good reason to leave. But all you got to do is wait for the rains to come to refill the cisterns, and you can come back. So there's an article on that. Uh, I'm the second author on it. First author is a, an archaeologist named Stephanie Sims, who got her PhD at Boston University in 2013 under Bill Saturno. And uh, that's in the Journal of Field Archaeology, published in 2012, I think. Stephanie Sims. I've seen her name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's, she's a paleoethnobotanist, too. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. hilltops, the, they're not particularly great for growing crops, right? But Exactly. It frees up land for growing crops down in the bottom ones. Hill's also pretty, pretty handy for defense as well if you're trying to protect passes. So I have a LiDAR image in this talk where you can see a, a wall surrounding a, a hill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They, I mean, they ring Kiwi. Basically, any major center that's in a valley probably has hilltop sites surrounding it. In some cases, they have elite complexes. You're so familiar. I guess I've been to Catherine Shurik, and she. Evan Parker. Hi. Pleasure. Louisiana State. And oh, I was at LSU, and I, and I was, uh, came down to Tulane quite a few times for hieroglyphics work. Yeah. Yeah, I think you look very familiar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it, I, from Tulane, I'm like, okay, I'll probably know, and maybe not as well, but at the very least. I'm around. You and the, uh, yeah. Uh, but she's now in California doing yeah. her uh, PhD. Yeah, on, at UC Merced. Yeah. Cool. 
Yeah, more digital heritage conservation yeah. slash archaeology, not just solely archaeology. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. good. He's a digger. Yeah. The, the school, I'm a digger. Yeah. There's, there's nothing wrong with digging. I'm, I'm all for it. I, I, I'd rather work with the. I'll, I'll, I'll personally, I prefer to let you guys do the digging and then work with the stuff that you're excavating. That's my personal preference. That's fine with him. Fine by me. Yeah. I mean, I don't mind digging. What he more, doesn't like, prefer... what he doesn't like, are the epigraphers. <laughs> oh, see, I, I, I love epigraphers. So. No, I, I love the epigraphers. I just well, can't well, do it myself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's a strange place. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Were you from Mississippi? I'm from Mississippi. Oh, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Mississippi. Well, I think, I think Mississippi and Louisiana uh, have a constant on the uh, rivalry about who's going to be number 49 or 50 on all the good stuff or one or two on the bad stuff. Yep. It's like an ongoing rivalry between the two. Am I missing something? No, no. That's it. You look at any state rankings, and, uh, so you know, in terms of you know, happiness, and yeah, they're, they're pretty happy, but in terms of, you know, livelihood, health, uh, all that sort of thing, it's terrible. <laughs> Pardon? Is that the state of being? That's why they're being nice happy? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. It's the food, mostly, I think. It's the food. So on, on Sunday, my, my plan is to go and boil five sacks of crawfish. Yeah, my, my dad uh, is, is also from Lafayette originally, and he, right. he doesn't like crawfish. All right. Yeah, yeah, that's what Okie dokie. Beverly. Yeah, I know Beverly. Uh, she forgot. You know, we're in a rhythm that we come, well, if nobody else is coming, we can start, and I'm sorry about the call. No worries. Then you can really uh, <laughs> tell us whatever you want. We will get. Is she not coming also? No, because she lives. <laughs> I sent a message to the wrong Evan Parker, who Oops. came, yeah, who came back saying that he wanted ten thousand dollars for this meeting <laughs> payment. Uh, I was flabbergasted because it took it aback. What students make ten thousand dollars? And and didn't just ask for ten thousand, like asked for it in a really nasty manner Very too. Nasty, yeah. Nasty. I know his professors, and I know, so I did not want to enter into this debate. Uh, and after a while, he finally says, Marcello calls me on the phone and says, Marta, that's not the Evan Parker we know. <laughs> I said, he didn't give me that impression that way either. Anyway, but here he is, and uh, we are very happy. Uh, whoever doesn't know that, this, um, the rage among the Maya 
work right now is the free class, especially in the Yucatan, which for years everybody thought that there was no free classic settlements in the Yucatan, in the low, in the highland, no, the lowlands, northern lowlands. So I am, I am delighted to to listen to uh, to what you have to say. He has how much longer for your. Uh, Hmm. Uh, probably like a year and a half. I gotta write. I gotta write the dissertation. It's very near Pee Week, which we have all visited, or most of us have visited, and um, and he works with Tomas, whom we know very well, and he, uh, you know, so he knows George Bay. He's working with George Bay. That means his dissertation is. is in, I thought it was being done in Chile, but no. Uh, you know. So anyway, uh, welcome. And I apologize for the group, but we are very interesting people. So, yes, I saw that. I saw that. Yeah, Ed, I think y'all did a y'all did a great job. Look, y'all did a great job of publicizing. That's that's for sure. Oh, for the lights. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah we put the light stream on, so because it's being live streamed also. All right. Yeah. Greetings, uh, everyone on the internet. Um, all right. Well, th thank you all for for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's nice being able to come right out of the field and get to talk to a bunch of people who are really excited about this sort of thing, about what we've been finding out about the pre-classic in northern Yucatan. As you all were kind of saying, uh, for a very long time, archaeologists thought that there was no pre-classic in northern Yucatan. In fact, when David Ferdell was taking his oral comprehensive exams, he was asked, by his professors said, all right, you're standing in northern Yucatan in 600 BC. Look around you. Describe what you see. It's a trick question because the answer then was, you don't see anything, that there was no pre-classic in northern Yucatan. Now we know that not only were there middle pre-classic occupations in northern Yucatan, and when I say middle pre-classic, I'm referring to a period of time from around 900 BC to 350 BC, but that in many ways it was just as intensive, uh, as monumental, as complex, and dare I say rich as uh, the middle pre-classic in the southern lowlands, in Guatemala, Belize, and Honduras. So what you're seeing uh, right there in that photo is a stack of jade. Jade spoons, uh, jade uh, pendants that were found in a small uh, bowl this summer at the site of Paso del Macho where I'm conducting my dissertation research. That's probably the single greatest concentration of jade ever found within a single vessel for the Middle Preclassic in all the Maya world. This is the northern Yucatan. All right? We're here to challenge uh, what, you know, what people originally thought about this place. All right, so whenever we do think about uh, the Puk region in northern Yucatan, we think about these beautiful vaulted buildings uh, with uh, veneers featuring geometric designs, typically colonnettes or mosaics, the most famous of which can be found in the house of the governor and the nunnery quadrangle at Ushmal in the top left right there. Bottom left is uh, from the site of Kiwik, Makuche Palace. Even in spite of some of the most uh, beautiful architecture in the Maya world, uh, I think the poop kind of gets left out of um, uh, discussions of the classic Maya oftentimes, simply because there wasn't as much hieroglyphic writing being produced at this time, uh, these sites uh, kind of reached their apogee right around the same time that uh, sites in the southern lowlands were collapsing. Uh, the picture on the right there is a photo of the Kiwik Valley um, from a fire tower that's erected uh, on one of the hilltops. So you can imagine in prehistory that wouldn't have been nearly as forested as it is now. Uh, uh, of course, the trees kind of hamper our ability to do research. Um, but uh, where Key Week is located now, uh, I've been working there since around uh, 2009 uh, at uh, the Biocultural Reserve of Cacho Key Week, which is owned by Millsaps College, where I did my undergraduate research. And so that's kind of where I started off in my archaeology. Our subject area, the Pook region, one of the most densely concentrated uh, 
areas in the Maya world. You look at Franz Blom's old map of where Maya sites are located, uh, and you probably will, <laughs> there's nowhere else that's as dense as the Puk region. And specifically, uh, my dissertation research has been focused here at a site called Pasado Macho. Now, if you haven't heard of it, don't sweat it, because uh, it was not identified until the year 2000 in a survey being conducted by Tomas Gaireta Negron. There were some preliminary excavations conducted there in 2002 and 2004, some in architectural spaces, some in non-architectural spaces, and these excavations confirmed that indeed almost the entire site dates to this middle pre-classic period, 900 BC to 350 BC. After that, investigations ended. I was shopping for a dissertation. George Bay, Tomas say, Evan, why don't you go and dig up Pasadal Macho? And I say, you know what, that sounds great. So you can see here uh, where the site is located aptly named Paso del Macho because it is located right here in a valley between all these very large hills. Uh, and it's called Paso del Macho. Uh, it's not named after me. It's not named after some other very strong, virile, young uh, muchacho. It is, uh, a macho refers to a very strong horse. And in order to pass along these roads back before there was automobiles uh, and you had a wagon hitched to your horse, you better have a really strong horse because otherwise whenever that horse is going downhill with the wagon. The horse isn't strong enough, the wagon's going to run, it's over, and, and you're, in, you're in a tight spot there. So that's what it refers to, pass, a pass of the really strong horse, basically. So not, not named after any strong guys. All right, so we have Huntich Mool right here, Labna right here. You'll notice that both Huntich Mool and Labna are located in areas uh, that uh, are kind of in valleys where there aren't too many of these uh, hilltops, whereas Pasadena Macho is located smack, right, right in the middle of where these hilltop sites are. As a result of this, we actually don't have too much classic period habitation right around here. This is uh, a, a nice little image rendered um, by a National Geographic uh, of the site of Kiwik. You can see the main pyramid. Uh, surrounding vaulted buildings in the Plaza Yashche right here. Uh, George Bay excavated in this plaza back in 2001 and collected the first large pottery sample of uh, pre-classic origins uh, that we know of from the Pook, and that's really kind of what got us started asking about, well, it, it seems like there were pre-classic peoples uh, living here. So I started working uh, in Kiwik and specifically at a small suburban hilltop site called Escalera al Cielo, the Stairway to Heaven. It's located on one of these hills that rings the nearby valley, almost entirely dates to the terminal classic period. Uh, this is a three-room uh, vaulted masonry structure that I excavated in 2012 and 2013. Uh, On-floor assemblages present in, uh, actually it's a two-room structure, um, in both rooms. However, we found that along this wall here, uh, it lacked masonry edges. It lacked nice uh, veneer stones. What that tells us is that most likely they were going to add on another room to that building, but they didn't. They ran out of time or they left before they could ever build it. This is a common uh, component of occupations in the Putin region where you'll find all of these large vaulted masonry buildings that uh, for whatever reason were not completed. Just to the east of this structure, I excavated this, two little, this little tiny two-room building here. And whenever we got down to the floor level, it was absolutely covered in artifacts, in pots, and stone tools that had been left behind. As I was explaining to some of y'all before the talk, this indicates that most likely people had been living here for some time. They decided to leave. They didn't take everything with them, suggesting that maybe they were planning on coming back. This most likely was a response uh, to drought. Now, I said uh, that I didn't have the most love for epigraphers. Um, I actually do love all the epigraphers. I'm just not very good at epigraphy myself. We actually found uh, some of the only hieroglyphs recovered from Kiwik whenever we excavated that vaulted masonry structure, a uh, hieroglyphic capstone. So in uh, the interiors of these vaulted rooms, uh, the keystone in the center line oftentimes would be plastered and painted with uh, images and glyphs. This one was uh, pretty beat up. Um, you can see <clears throat> a single foot right here with a little anklet. Typically these scenes from Pook houses uh, are of individuals, most likely the heads of households, making offerings to gods and dancing. 
I wasn't interested in the classic period for a few reasons after I worked at Escalera El Cielo. First of all, it's a lot of work to excavate one of these big masonry vaulted structures, and it's very expensive as well. And it was incredibly stressful, and I was like, well, this is really cool, but uh, I need a break from this. Uh, so I decided to instead uh, turn my focus to the pre-classic. George Bay discovers all these pre-classic ceramics at the site of Kiwik. Tomas Gaireta in 2004 begins excavations at a site just outside of Tikul and Oshkutskab called Shoknake. What you see here is all middle pre-classic. That is the Acropolis of Shoknake. Is this on private land? It is owned by a hacienda, I believe. Yes, there's a church there. Yes. We've been there before. Yeah. So this, uh, this was one of, this is probably the first case, I think, actually, of one of these huge monumental pre-classic centers being investigated in northern Yucatan. This Acropolis, this platform, measured over 100 meters by 100 meters, all pyramidal pre-classic. Nobody thought that there had been people even living in northern Yucatan, let alone constructing something as monumental uh, as this. So this, uh, this got everybody very excited. Um, and so Bill Ringel decided that he wanted his own middle pre-classic uh, monumental site. And so he begins mapping and excavating at another monumental site just outside of Oshkutskab called uh, Yashhom. So that's located right here, Yashhom, located in a very fertile valley. And uh, as everybody started in the world of my archeology span started obtaining LIDAR imagery of sites, basically, um, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's uh, a remote sensing method whereby a plane equipped with a laser uh, is able to uh, penetrate the tree cover to um, measure the topography of the ground and map an entire landscape. What you see in this light orange right here uh, is a survey area that Tomas Gaiareta uh, took several years to survey between Labna and Kiwik. We obtained, and specifically Bill obtained with a very nice NSF, uh, LIDAR coverage for both the Yashhom Valley and these areas right here. And already it's totally uh, redefined what we know about settlement in the Puk region from the pre-classic through the present. So Tomas has actually been working at this site called Kom outside of the uh, town of Shul. Gonna start working at this site called Sabana Piletas later this year. Bill and his team will continue to work uh, in Yashhom. This is a map that Bill made of Yashhom. Uh, now you can see uh, across this map all of these large vaulted masonry buildings uh, that all date to the classic period. Now the classic period Maya were um, innovative in many ways, uh, but they weren't uh, shy about building on top of somebody else's old mound. Uh, so in many cases what ended up happening was uh, many of these mounds that you see here were actually pre-classic and they just ended up erecting terminal classic vaulted buildings on them. This entire Acropolis right here, this huge massive uh, uh, occupation sequence with an E-group, so you can see this E-group here, used for purportedly uh, taking astronomical observations, but uh, uh, E-groups also just associated with Maya rituality more broadly, uh, possibly the first uh, readily identifiable uh, ritual architecture that you see in the Maya world were these e-groups. Um, sites like Sival. Um, uh, Sival, is, I think, is the oldest one that they found, but also uh, Sebal. We even have them here in northern Yucatan as well. So this giant Acropolis right here, again, pure middle pre-classic. And we also have kind of a little tiny middle pre-classic village sites too, not just these huge monumental centers. So whenever George Bay was working in the Ashche Palace of Kiwik, he found pre-classic floors and pre-classic platforms at the site. So I said, well, okay, I wanna investigate the middle pre-classic. I can't handle one of these monumental sites for a dissertation, that's too much. You gotta, gotta you know, have realistic goals here. Uh, so uh, instead I end up um, deciding to do my dissertation research at the site of Pasado Macho, which is another small middle pre-classic village, and it didn't ha have all this classic period stuff buried on top of it. Right. Pure middle pre-classic. 
So this is the LiDAR coverage. You can see this is the site core right here. Very small, right? Now I surveyed the surrounding valley right here and we found house mounds located throughout this area. Many of them appear to be pre-classic based on surface collected pottery. However, even with the LiDAR, which measures to a very accurate degree the topography, there are house mounds that don't show up here that are probably pre-classic. Uh, part of it has to do with vegetation. Um, so if it's particularly scrubby vegetation, low to ground vegetation, it can obscure it. If it's this tall, it might just blend in enough with the surrounding topography to render it invisible. Yeah. Oh, that's the road. That's a road, yeah. So, so the soil is just this, yeah, no, there's no, uh, so, so yeah, for the Pook region, uh, we don't have any sources of surface water. You gotta go, if you. There are a couple of different wells, but you know, it's like in that Stephen and Cather Woods painting where all the people are going down the ladder into that well. It's because you gotta go down 200 meters to get to the water table because the Pook region is an ancient coastline that was raised up and the rest of Yucatan is much more low lying. So water accessibility is an issue here. Well then I guess a follow up question to that and that's something I had from like one of your first, very first slides, but it's mm -hmm. worth here too. You were mentioning the idea of all the hills around it and obviously it's very visible here. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, well, it's interesting too because this road right here actually follows the least cost path. So you know we can use GIS tools and determine that whenever you turn on your GPS on your phone to go from point A to point B, you're just following a least cost path, right? shortest distance possible, or least effort expended possible. And this is that least cost path right here. And it goes directly through Paso del Macho. You can see in the LIDAR here, actually, this wall. See this wall here? Yeah, that's man-made. That's man-made, and it's not an ancient, it's not like a recent cattle fence or something. That is most likely a fortification. We found matates located along here. Most likely there were soldiers who were bivouacked along this hill in ancient times controlling and basically keeping an eye out on this pass. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. Through the LIDAR surveys, hmm? pardon? Exactly, I, I have not gotten up there yet, but it's, <laughs> it's a platform, yeah, I mean, it's, it's big. Um, I, and I haven't gone to check out these platforms either, but you can see, I mean, there's, there's stuff everywhere here. LIDAR has changed the game for us, yeah. So even before we had all the nice LiDAR stuff, yeah. uh, we still had a total station map made and the site core is tiny. That's pretty small, right? So it's about a 30 by 40 meter plaza here. This is the principal mound on the western end, probably the center of ritual life. Um, about three meters tall. On the western end here, you see a ball court, a ball court. So my, uh, a lot of my original research questions whenever I decided to start working at Paso del Macho revolved around the ball game and the ball court. So uh, Tony Andrews and Fernando Robles uh, began conducting survey around Merida many years ago and found uh, all of these middle pre-classic sites surrounding Merida. Some of them were very large on the same order just about of Comchen. So Stobo, for example, if you all know David Anderson, uh, he did his dissertation at Stobo. But in many cases, they found all of these super tiny sites all around Merida that were pure middle preclassic. And many of them, around 24, might be up to 27 now even, contain ball courts. No other area in Mesoamerica has anywhere near these numbers of ball courts dating to the middle preclassic. This suggests that the ball game was very important to the Maya of northern Yucatan. All right, that perhaps uh, kind of its uh, distillation or importance as kind of a pastime, at least in a monumental sense, 
was crystallized here in northern Yucatan. And in some cases, in some of these sites, like uh, San Geronimo, um, Benetunas, these are tiny sites, right? And in some cases, the only thing at the entire site is the ball court. Fascinating, right? And always at small sites, too. Uh, this is one of the ball courts that was excavated at Shani La. Here we go. I love it whenever they're doing the reconstruction here. They've got a cross set up here. I thought that was a great, uh, very synergistic uh, example of, um, of, of modern and ancient Maya uh, religious clashing here. All right, so back to Paso del Macho. Uh, I didn't actually get around to digging much in the ball court until this last year. I started digging in the plaza and in Structure One and around some of these other platforms because we started finding such cool stuff I just didn't get around to the ball court. So uh, we have monumental architecture. Monumental, it's not that big. This is structure one here. It looks, just looks like a pile of rocks. There's really no wall alignments or anything like that that are visible. Uh, pretty small. This is in the playing alley of the ball court. So if you're standing in the, uh, in the end of the ball court, this is where they would have been playing ball right here. Here's one lateral structure, and here's the other. Not very big. Big enough. <laughs> We excavated in the plaza of the site, and uh, I was told by several archaeologists who will go unnamed um, that uh, there was no point in digging in the plaza except to get a ceramic sequence to date the chronology of the site, um, and that's all you should dig in the plaza for. Yet it seemed like every single unit that I put in the plaza, we found a building. All right, so uh, just in this photo right here, see one platform located right here another platform here, there were platforms located over here. All of this subsurface architecture that dates to the earliest occupation of the site. The pottery recovered from these little tiny platforms, this little tiny platform right here. Some of the earliest pottery found in northern Yucatan, what we call ekphase pottery, probably dating from around 900 BC to 800 BC. So you're looking at one of the earliest platforms right here in Yucatan. Do you know the source of the pottery? Uh, we think it's locally made. Yeah, and actually we might have identified an even earlier phase of pottery uh, from uh, several sites in the region. Haven't found any at Paso del Macho, unfortunately. Don't have everything there yet. Uh, these little tiny platforms most likely had uh, wooden structures erected on top of them that were coated uh, in mud, daubed basically. So we find this burned daub uh, all around the excavations in the plaza. In the plaza excavations we find stone tools so for example, we find monos used for grinding corn, handstones for grinding corn. We find matate fragments, no whole matates, but matate fragments. These are flat matates. Typically in the classic period, matates are curved and rounded. You'll see them at every pook site you go to. These are pretty flat, probably low to the ground. Uh, limestone tools and a bark beater, a bark beater. These bark beaters are stone tools that were utilized to make paper and a fig tree bark. Uh, I, it was found in a pre-classic context, not sure entirely uh, if it is pre-classic or not. And behind one mound we found this thing. And uh, whenever we found it I was uh, just about jumped out of my skin because it was so cool. This is not a pre-classic uh, stone sculpture. This is actually most likely terminal classic. In fact, there's a building at Labna that has these exact same heads uh, inserted into the moldings all around it. Most likely somebody, either recently or in historic times, ran off with one of those heads and, for whatever reason, buried it behind a mound at Paso del Macho. We've done some cool science-y things, too. Uh, archaeometric testing, uh, looking at pottery and seeing what rare earth elements are present in those pottery using uh, ICPMS testing. And we found, to some degree, that the earliest pottery, specifically called kin pottery that you see here, and Achiote's pottery, tend to kind of cluster off or be their own groups, um, basically suggesting that uh, there were different manufacturing processes and possibly clay sources utilized for the earliest pottery, that they hadn't yet identified perhaps the best clay sources uh, in northern Yucatan. Here's some of that early pottery that you see. The most diagnostic feature for it are these post-slip incisions. I call them post-slip incisions. So they would slip put the slip, a nice uh, cer ceramic wash over the pot, and then they would scratch these lines into them. Typically, uh, cross-hatching patterns. It doesn't show up as well here, but uh, uh, you find these cross-hatching patterns, all these nice kind of uh, orange-red 
uh, uh, slips, earliest pottery uh, uh, agreed upon that's been found in Yucatan. So we trenched uh, structure one here, the largest structure at the site, a four by six meter trench, and we found two substructures within it. The oldest, uh, or the, uh, the, sorry, the most recent substructure, the one that you see on the surface, probably dates to around uh, 500 BC or so. This platform here, so this is the, uh, uh, the original plaza surface right here, and this is a two-tiered platform. So you go up one step, then you go up on the second step. This one appears to date to around 700 BC, based on radiocarbon analysis. You can see another wall up here. That's the next level that was built, and then they finished off with this right here. So as the principal kind of ritual area of the site, see ex uh, repeated expansions and reuse of it over time. We excavated uh, some of the other platforms at the site, and again, you know, you see this architecture and you say, what is going on there? That is the, ugly, those are the ugliest stones I've ever seen. Very simple, all right? It's, it's all on the surface, so uh, 2,000 years has not been kind to it. Typically a basal, uh, you'll see a basal retain, retaining wall here, and they would have an impermanent structure erected on top of that. Uh, we dug in the ball court. Um, this is the backside of the ball court right here if you're in the plaza. Again, pile of rocks. Uh, this is in the playing alley here, so this would have been the border for the bench uh, of the ball court. So you could bounce the ball on the side of the bench and it would come rolling back into the court. This is the border for it right here. It seems like they had an earthen floor for playing that had been pounded onto a cobbled surface. You get a good bounce out of that rubber ball. This is the trench in the interior of it. And we did not find anything in the inside of the ball court. It seems to have been constructed in a single phase of construction, most likely actually dating to the end of the site. It was not one of the earlier structures of the site. So the ball court and the ball game actually don't retain a lot of importance until much later uh, in the Middle Pre-Classic, at least for the people here in Paso del Macho. Now, uh, the thing, yeah. No markers. We, dig in the, we dug in the center. We dug some in the uh, outsides. No markers, unfortunately. Great question. I get asked that a lot. It's good. So you found like the rest of the bowl courts that have been found had any markers? Some do, but they're, they're not a... It's not, a, it's not that they didn't have it at that period, but... Yeah. Exactly. It, uh, and they're not, uh, you know, the kind of markers maybe we think of for the classic oh. period. Typically, it's just like a ring, a ring of stones, a ring of stones. We did not find that at Paso del Macho, unfortunately. Now, the thing that's really making, wa uh, that's really making waves that we found at Paso del Macho have to do with excavations that we did in the center of the plaza in the last two years. So uh, the green, the two green squares that you see right there, I excavated those in the last couple days of the 2017 season. We found a series of offerings there. It's a two by four meter excavation area. And what we found was so great that we had to go back and dig more. So armed with a grant from National Geographic, we dug all the remainder uh, of these pink units here uh, in, this last, um, in this last year. Now, for those two pink squares that we dug in the last couple days of 2017, that field season, we found nine pottery vessels six greenstone axes, a greenstone spoon, and three greenstone pendants. In the pink area in the center there, whenever uh, I came back in 2018, we identified 11 additional caches, which included uh, four greenstone axes, three greenstone flakes, four greenstone pebbles, uh, seven basalt bifaces, uh, five Eck phase pottery dishes, those are those really old pottery pieces, and 18 jade spoons and pendants. Also found three substructures in a six by eight uh, meter area. So these are photos from the 2017 excavations of these offerings that we found in the center of the plaza. And so you can already recognize some elements here. So for example, these two pottery vessels here, which you see right there. You can see one of the greenstone axes here, a pile of basalt here an overturned uh, ceramic vessel, a jade plaque, a jade uh, uh, axe, a ceramic vessel with several jade and basalt pieces in it. There's a lot. Yeah, it was kind of overwhelming. Can you identify the source of jade? I'm on it. 
No, no, that's okay. There's only, there, there is, but there's a sub area actually. And, uh, Somebody says that there's another source that uh, they oh, say that there's got to be one, but they haven't identified it. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So there were three different major construction episodes in the center of this plaza that span the full occupation of the site. So from roughly 900 BC to around 350 BC, they built three different floor layers. Whenever they arrived at the site, they deposited what we call foundational offerings. These are objects of immense value that imbued the landscape with cosmological power and most likely served as maybe what you would consider uh, the formation of a social pact or social contract, saying that we're going to settle here, we're going to cooperate for the success of this settlement. <clears throat> so what you see in this drawing here are these original, uh, uh, these original founding deposits, what we call them. So they made these and then they constructed a small platform right around them, all right? So here's one of these uh, green stone or jade axes that we found. Almost looks like an egg, right? P laid on this pile of basalt right here and you can see in this soil, look how red it is. That's this natural sterile soil later, what we call the concob, red earth. Now, just to the north of that axe, we found this huge pile of basalt. Basalt is a volcanic stone, definitely not local to this area at all. This basalt here most likely comes from the Tuchla Mountains, basically, basically where the old Mecca are from. We excavated away this basalt pile here and we found these three green stone axes. Cleaned off. Facing east, so their sharpened bits are facing east in a north-south alignment. This is not a cruciform or four-sided arrangement. Under that, several additional greenstone axes, so they were just kind of piled on top of each other. And under that, this little tiny bowl. And inside that bowl, these stacks of jades that were oriented to the cardinal directions arranged in a quadripartite manner, consisting of uh, spoons and pendants. So whenever I brushed them off with a toothbrush and water, this is what we were left with. The concave had adhered to the surface of these things and you couldn't get it off. Uh, but utilizing uh, a mild acid, we were eventually left with this the single greatest concentration of middle pre-classic jades uh, ever found in the Maya world. Y'all are some of the first people to see this. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> so this just came out of the ground uh, about a month ago. All right. Oh, it's in the lab in Oshkutskab right now. So once I'm done with the analysis, most likely, well, that's really up to the directors ultimately. I wouldn't be surprised if you know, I mean, they're museum, it's a museum quality piece, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, what you see here uh, are all these different kind of shapes, right? Now, every single one of these uh, has drilled holes, little tiny drilled holes. Jade is an extremely hard stone, but all of them have drilled holes suggesting that they were being worn. So this is, uh, this is something that, the, that you know, we, the classic Maya end up you know, creating all these glyphs and everything, and then we look back and we say, oh, maybe that's what they were talking about. Um, the, uh, the jury's still out on what these things actually function for, these specifically. So they're called spoons, right? Uh, there's an art historian who argues that all of these were utilized for um, spinning fabric, um, that they were utilized for cloth production and that eventually cloth production became associated as an elite activity. And uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and that certain individuals who would spin this cloth would end up wearing the implements that they were spinning it with. I don't know if that's the case for Northern Yucatan. Billy Follensby is the name of the art historian, by the way, who's, uh, who's, who's promoted that idea. Um, uh, and she's published on it as well. All right, 
And this piece here actually features an arm, an arm, and a torso. It's Olmec-style iconography. Um, I think it's a purely Maya site, but that eventually these jades made their way here, either from the Olmec area, perhaps even farther <laughs> south. They would be broken and reused. They didn't really care about the artwork so much uh, as they were in just the material uh, uh, of the jade itself. It's a, uh, so they would break it and they polished it, but in, you can tell that the broken surfaces aren't as smooth as the original surfaces. Most likely, I think it was the northern Yucatecos who were actually breaking it um, and doing some of the drilling because there are actually several errors on these pieces. You can see where they started drilling in one area and it wasn't working out, so they switched to somewhere else. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Mm -hmm. and it has the drawing, and it has not been disturbed, I would assume that the drawing is from the Greek classics. Yeah. And, but they only had it. Well, even, even for classic Maya jades that we find, oftentimes they'll feature Olmec iconography, but they've been reshaped or they'll have circumscribed over them classic area epigraphy, right? That's not the case here. Yeah. Was the bowl that... Mm -hmm. So here you can see uh, this bowl is super fragmented. It'll literally fall apart in your hands. Um, kind of an unslipped, uh, very early vessel. We actually think these are probably pre-Eck, so they could date to as early as 1000 BC. We have carbon samples from these contexts that will be dated this summer to confirm this. This could be some of the earliest caches from northern Yucatan, in other words, from the first settlers who come uh, to this region. On the rims of the ceramic vessel, we found these little applique designs here, along with this on the bottom right here. It's either a turtle or a frog. Ceramic applique turtles or frogs. These are animals associated with water, fertility, and life. Consequently, jade, in both the pre-classic and in later times, is also associated with water, fertility, life, and maize. So what you end up with here is perhaps one of the purest distillations of a rain or fertility cultural complex or cult for the pre-classic in the Maya world. It's all just in this little tiny bowl with a bunch of jade axes stacked on top of it. So it's a cosmological message, right? because these jade axes stand for the same things, basically, as all these do. Except you can't wear these things, they're too, they're, they're big. All right, now these were all found in this area right here, found right outside of this platform here, real tiny, right? So this is the earliest floor at the site, built almost directly on top of sterile soil. Uh, prior to the construction of that platform, they end up smashing a vessel as a, Perhaps you would call it uh, termination or, or you know, something of that nature. Uh, and then uh, they, uh, whenever they're building this platform, they add several caches to the inside of it. Again, this is still to the founding of the site. So this little tiny ceramic bowl here with a bunch of uh, uh, basalt and greenstone pebbles in the interior of it. A lip-to-lip -lip cache consisting of an overturned dish placed on top of a bucket filled with basalt and another greenstone spoon. Under that, another small ceramic bowl that you see here with a basalt biface. I know I'm going through these quick. It's because I had a lot of slides and it's just so much fun to talk about it. Uh, all right, uh, just to the south of all that, we found a complete marine shell necklace. I've never found something like this before. I find marine shell beads, but never a bunch of them all strung up together. The strings didn't exist, but you know, whatever. All right, uh, for this particular cache here, again, this is part of the founding assemblage of the site, another small ceramic bowl with a uh, uh, greenstone jade plaque placed in the interior of it. This thing is big. I mean, it's bigger than your hand. Again, drilled, a beautiful piece. Under that, three pieces of basalt, uh, 
arranged almost like a, uh, a support or base for holding the, the, the dish. Now this might perhaps uh, be uh, kind of hearkening to these three-pronged ceramic sensors that you find elsewhere in the southern lowlands that basically would have a lid placed on top of it and the smoke would billow forth out of this area here. So maybe that's what we have going on. At Paso del Macho, we actually do have several ceramic uh, sensor fragments. I have not seen sensors reported elsewhere for the pre-classic in northern Yucatan. I'm sure they probably are, just people haven't thought about publishing them. These are actually ceramic sensors from the uh, Grijalva Basin farther south in the southern lowlands. I think we're seeing both, uh, the, kind of the same thing. In a platform uh, directly adjacent to where all this stuff was found, we found a burial. And again, I think this is probably one of the earliest burials that we have in northern Yucatan. What you see here is the cranium, an arm, and the long bones. What happened with this individual was uh, they basically were placed directly on the sterile soil surface, covered over with a floor, and then they built all of these platforms and stuff. Placed in a flexed position, facing east. Only grave goods we found were several shells deposited at their feet, and these very strange artifacts that I've never seen anywhere else before. Uh, they're made of limestone. They look like axes, except they have these incisions on the end. They almost look like jaguar paws. Um, it could be a sprouting maze type uh, uh, iconography. I'm not entirely sure, but these are the only grave goods associated with the burial. No jade, no jade. So the individual is probably very powerful. Maybe not very powerful, but uh, not powerful enough to carry a bunch of jade to their grave, but powerful enough to be buried kind of close to it. So an individual of some distinction, perhaps. They began building all these platforms kind of on top of each other in the center of the plaza. And basically off of the corners of all of these platforms, they would deposit green stone axes uh, or just kind of weird green stone uh, oblong pieces. And they even ended up tearing out part of the, of the platform wall um, to kind of deposit some of these caches, uh, specifically these two vessels here. These are uh, Hoventude Red, Middle Preclassic, kind of your standard typical uh, 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 red ware type, uh, except it, given a very particular form uh, in vase form. These particular uh, style of vases, uh, the slip is normal, but um, this vase design here, not very typical. So these are actually some of the latest ceramic vessels that we end up having from the cache. Inside one of them, uh, we get it all nice and cleaned off. They're absolutely stunning vessels for the middle pre-classic at least. I know they don't stack up against the, Ma the classic Maya, but for the middle pre-classic, they're pretty great. Another green stone pendant found in the interior of this one. And this one here, another green stone pendant that we find. Beautiful red wares. Oh. Uh, this last summer found this nice lip-to-lip -lip cache. Um, most likely, again, um, very early ceramic vessels, uh, most likely early black wares. So what you see here is an overturned dish placed in the mouth of another dish right here. And then on top of all this, they built this ugly wall that doesn't connect to anything. And I have no idea what it's doing there, but it is a wall. <laughs> and this is the last offering that was made. The latest one, I should say, the one made probably around 400 BC or so. A ring of basalt stones with this nice dark green jade axe in the center. Right next to that is a, is a beautiful blue-green Olmec jade uh, axe. So these are some of the ceramic vessels that we found from these caches. Uh, if we look at ceramic caches from elsewhere that date to the pre-classic and the Maya lowlands, uh, we can think of one of the most famous examples from, from late pre-classic uh, 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 Seros, found by David Ferdell, a bucket cache, very similar to the bucket that we found, inside of which were several greenstone pieces. I think this is probably a slightly more developed sense of 
uh, Maya kingship or Maya uh, authority than what we had at Paso del Macho because you have these nice carved jade heads here. But I think they're kind of working up to that at Paso del Macho. At Yashuna, in what they call the dancing platform, which dates to the middle pre-classic, excavations there by uh, 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 Suler and David Friedel found another bucket cache with a limestone sphere on the inside, a small jade axe and jade mirror in the bottom. Most likely these were all bundled together. There was a bunch of organic detritus surrounding them. We weren't lucky enough to get something like that at Paso del Macho. And if we look at all of this green stone, there's a lot of it. Uh, much more, I think, than what we end up with at other uh, pre-classic sites. Certainly the most green stone ever found uh, from a pre-classic site in northern Yucatan. Talking about jade sources, Matagua River Valley in Guatemala is where all jade comes from. However, there is a specific source for that really blue jade. Right, now the classic Maya tended to like this really nice, deep, rich, radiant green jade. Pre-classic Olmec, and it seems that pre-classic Yucatecos like this blue jade, which actually comes from a subsource within the uh, Matagua River Valley that was initially uh, uncovered by Carl Tauba. You'll notice that for these large uh, axes, we call them celts, in some cases we even call them pseudocelts, they feature these flaws. You can see them here uh, where they've kind of been chipped away. So you say either these people didn't know what they were doing with these things, either there was some kind of accident that befell them, uh, or they are what you consider to be preforms. Um, so in lithic technology, we discuss how basically objects are reduced to smaller and smaller sizes until they reach their final forms. Perhaps that's what you have here, where these are soon to be axes, but they just never made it that far. Now these, uh, they call them uh, in other places, they call them pseudo celts because they're not quite narrow enough to be considered pure celts. Um, so that uh, those descriptions were originally made by Drucker at uh, Laventa where they found a lot of these kinds of uh, pseudo celts or pseudo axes. Axes as a phenomenon in Mesoamerica go way back. So some of the earliest expressions of the importance of axes can be found in the Olmec area, the site of El Manati, basically a spring dating to the early pre-classic. This is how we know that these axes are associated with water and fertility is because they're typically found in waterborne contexts like places uh, like uh, El Manati. Likewise, we do find them at San Lorenzo as well, not as many as, uh, as you find at other Olmec sites, but they are certainly there. Um, finely crafted, finely honed. La Venta, however, is where we get the first really big explosion of axes found uh, principally in this area here. Now this is one of the most famous offerings uh, in Mesoamerica and probably my favorite, and I guess the Templo Mayor ones come close to it maybe, uh, but uh, this uh, kind of uh, almost vignette uh, scene here of all these individuals uh, most likely communing with the spiritual realm. You can see their faces aren't exactly human. And what do you see behind them? This kind of gets put in the background, but all of these axes with, uh, uh, that are all inscribed. Drucker's excavations at Laventa exposed huge numbers of these greenstone caches uh, aligned, let me say, in a very similar fashion to what we see at Paso del Macho. In other words, uh, kind of laid out in these parallel lines like this with all the bits facing the same direction. Seen again here. Some cruciform arrangements found as well. That is kind of four-sided arrangements in almost a cross-like fashion. Moving eastward in Chiapas, San Isidro, other quadripartite caches Greenstone axes associated with massive ear flares. Very cool. Tecomate is with greenstone axes. Chapa de Corso, excavations by John Clark, finding more quadripartite axe forms. Again, this isn't necessarily Maya, right? We, we're kind of, you know, we call them maybe Zoke offerings. 
And then we get to say Paul, where Takeshi Inomata has been working, actually finished up working uh, several years, excavations in the center of the site here. Uh, one of the reasons why Takeshi decided to go and work at Sebal and do pre-classic archaeology at Sebal was because of the project run by Gordon Willey uh, uh, and also helped out by one of my mentors, uh, Will Andrews, where he found several of these greenstone axes that had never been found at any other Maya site before in a pre-classic context. And I think this kind of got Takeshi thinking, it's like, well, something, something, something going on here, along with all the pre-classic pottery that they found. And sure enough, uh, as they begin excavating deep into the plazas of Sebal, on an east-west axis, they end up finding many green stone caches, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, jade axes of exquisite quality and polish. In some cases, a little more brutish, but still beautiful. Green stone placed in ceramic vessels, where have we seen that before? If you know Francisco Estrada Belli, the jade axes uh, and uh, pottery caches found from Sival. Again, some of the earliest uh, middle pre-classic caches ever found uh, arranged in a quadripartite fashion. So you can see the smashed ceramic vessels here. Under this were all of these greenstone axes. You can see their reconstruction of how it was here. Uh, modern reconstruction of uh, replacing how these were uh, aligned. Bringing me back to Northern Yucatan and what makes Northern Yucatan unique because there are some shared elements of these caches that, that we share. We're definitely tied in the Mesoamerican system here, but in some ways, Northern Yucatan is wholly unique in its expression of this sort of thing. So here we have what are called the Jades of Chaxinquin. Uh, these were from eluded context and were brought to Will Andrews in the 1980s where he published them. A jade axe, several jade beads found at the site of Tipical by Carlos Peraza Lope. And of course, the Yashuna caches. Um, Robles Cassiano has found several greenstone caches at Pochilam. Tomas Gaireta has found a greenstone axe at Xochneke, but nothing on the scale of what we have at Pasto del Macho. So these are the jades found from that site of Chaxinquin, published by Will Andrews. Find lots of spoons these objects that we call knuckle dusters here, as well as uh, kind of almost votive type um, uh, uh, carved jade pieces. Here we have fossil macho on the right, chaxinquin on the left. When I say that there is a particular Yucateco tradition when it comes to these greenstone pieces, this is what I'm talking about that other middle preclassic sites in the Maya world do not have this sort of thing. They don't have all of these spoons. They don't have the knuckle dusters. They don't have the pendants. Very unique expression. Now they find uh, the occasional spoon down in Belize at middle preclassic sites, but this is the Yucatecan jade complex here. Will Andrews uh, originally posited that these jades were carved in Olmec style, but he then uh, changed uh, his thinking when he began seeing all these jades that were being found in Costa Rica. Basically, uh, he ended up arguing that many of these jades probably were carved in Costa Rica and then moved northward. So we tend to look westward toward the Olmec for the Middle Preclassic. Maybe we should be looking farther south, uh, expanding our horizons a little bit. I don't think that they're, they're necessarily wrong about this either. So these were uh, kind of the founding rituals um, and incredibly complex ideological phenomenon that we have here um, that kind of plays out throughout the Maya world but attains its own uh, unique expression in northern Yucatan. The ball game. One of the most salient features of ancient Mesoamerica, again, present at a site with this much jade. Hill and Clark argued that perhaps the ball game is one of the pathways toward inequality, that through spon inequality. inequality, that perhaps through sponsorship of the ball game, through the construction of ball courts, maybe that's one way that you gain prestige. And not necessarily playing, right? 
Um, you know, players, players of a ball game perhaps retire after a while, but uh, maybe it's the people who sponsor these teams, sponsor the construction of these areas that end up gaining power. Maybe that's what we see at Paso Macho too. Here's a list of traits that we see um, for northern Yucatan. Uh, grappling with the implications of these caches for Pasado Macho, for the Puk region, and for northern Yucatan, uh, we can say it's pretty surprising that such a modest settlement, such a tiny little site, contains that much greenstone, that many pottery caches. We say either that other middle preclassic settlements have these caches and we simply haven't found them, or Pasado Macho was a place of special significance. We can say that the pre-classic Maya of northern Yucatan aren't living in a cultural backwater, that they're front and center for defining what Mesoamerican ideologies will be for the classic period. And it's just that we're just now finding out about them. So we have monumental acropoli, we have triadic groups, e-groups, the most ball courts in Mesoamerica, quadrangular architecture, defined plazas and site plans, tiered settlement hierarchies, long distance exchange of highly valued goods, intricate rituals, deposition of these valuable items. All of these things coming together, you have to say Northern Yucatan um, is, is, is paving the way for the pre-classic. And I thank y'all very much for having me. Um, it was a real pleasure to come here and, and, and present this talk. Yeah. I went a little bit over time. It's Sorry. It's okay. Um, my, my question is, um, we talked about the abandonment, but you were, they were expecting to come back? Yes, for Escalera al Cielo. Uh, right. So, which is the, the, the third of the horse and then the, the stay awake in heaven was like a funny metaphor. Tomas, Tomas comes up with really good He's names for sites, right. yes. <laughs> Tomas, Tomas named both of those sites. So Escalero Cielo comes from his love for Led Zeppelin and Paso Del Macho because uh, he's a very learned individual. Not deep at all. So, if they were coming back, could that be... Like oh, well, so for Paso Del Macho, uh, I, the abandonment of that site, I, I have not fully grasped how it went. It seemed to have been a very gradual abandonment. Just Escalera El Cielo was rapidly abandoned. Okay. Yeah. Because, I mean, these are valuable, and they knew they were valuable. Uh, they were not easy to get. Uh, and, of course, they could have been, maybe since they were coming from the Motawa River all the way to the Olmec, they said, let me keep some of this as a trade. This is, no, 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 this is actually a brilliant question. You say, what leads somebody to bury some of the most wealthy items that you could possess, right? right. Um, in some ways you say, well, maybe some individuals aren't going to be allowed to transmit these items through generations. Uh, maybe you say that they're deposited in the ground because that is how you get that social pact. The fact that you're saying, we're gonna leave these things here, nobody's going to own them, this is the center of our community and ideological life right here. Now you say, well, why, why did they abandon the site and just leave these things here? That's a little more complicated. Um, do people forget that these items are here because they're spanning hundreds of years? I mean, you know, we, we hear about people finding, you know, treasure troves of their own family documents or something like that, right? That you never knew that your family had these sorts of things. And that's just, you know, over the span of decades, not hundreds of years. So maybe memory fades. Maybe, I don't know, that's, uh, that's actually a question I haven't really come to terms with yet. But it's a good one because you say, why do people, why are people willing to put these things in the ground in the first place? And then why are they willing to leave all of it here for later in time? It's either, so we're gonna try, we're gonna try and source it, uh, but it is most likely either from the Tuchlas, 
uh, Chris Poole has looked at it, and he thinks it looks very Tuchla-esque, but it can be anywhere where there's volcanoes. So it could be from Guatemala, too. It could be. Mm -hmm. It could be. Now I don't know I don't know what all these uh, all these Yucatecos are sending back in return for stuff you yeah. know. Three fifty BC. I think it's pretty concrete. Yeah, so we're gonna run about seven to ten radiocarbon tests this summer, and I doubt any of them will be later than three fifty BC. Yeah, you know they, the the droughts the droughts aren't as yeah the the droughts aren't as intense um, for the preclassic as they end up being later in the classic period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, another kind of aspect of of this is that they they probably weren't as adept at managing water as the classic Maya were. It is the, one of the most confounding questions for Paso del Macho that I have not entirely addressed because we know that there are habitation sites around it. I don't know what they're doing for water. There is an iguata right outside the site, but it's not that big. I don't know if it would have been big, it would have been big enough to support that whole population throughout a dry season. What do you expect the population to be? That was my next question. What's the estimated population to be? Probably in the high hundreds. I'd say, say less, than less, oh, less than a thousand even, I'd say. Yeah, and, and even then, you, you can't rule out the fact that it might have been a seasonally inhabited site, that it could have served a special function. Um, maybe the reason why you don't find these things at the major monumental centers is that this small center served as a site for in, in powerful elites to live. We know one of the characteristics of kings, especially early kings, is that they're sequestered from their populations because they're considered dangerous. I don't know if that's what's happening here, but. Yeah, and, the, and one of the ideas about the ball court too is that uh, these smaller sites are basically fielding teams and competing against one another. So you basically have these leagues of ball teams in northern Yucatan traveling from site to site. That's what they say, but I, I mean, it could just be teams within the community playing each other too. Yeah, you can't, you couldn't play the ball game in the rain. Exactly. Because it would just go splat. <laughs> Indeed, um, yeah, yeah. There are, some, there are some indigenous rubber species uh, in northern Yucatan, but I don't know if it's the kind that they would use to make the ball. Mm -hmm. I know, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about, those, those hand stones that appear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, no. And even those aches are yeah. they're different than these aches. Yeah, so so yeah, I mean there's several different species of rubber trees and one or two of them are present in northern Yucatan, but I don't know if it was the preferred type. I mean, Tabasco, yeah, I mean, you know, that what is what does Olmec mean, but you know, rubber rubber people basically. So um, it, it could have been it was probably the Olmec area. Probably, but My, well, my advisor told me that now every archaeologist is going to start digging little middle preclassic villages in northern Yucatan because you can find this. You can find this in a little village. Do, do you know Michael Callahan? Yeah. From, uh, well, that's from Guatemala. Yeah. But it's all preclassic. What's coming out is all preclassic. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, so, so we're pushing the edges of what the middle preclassic is going to be. Um, I think they're going to keep finding more sites like this. Now you always got to be looking ahead if you're going to be a my archaeologist and see what the next 
big thing is, right? I don't know if it's necessarily going to be the pre-classic. I think it's actually going to be the early classic in that archaeology in southern Quintana Roo. Focusing on the early classic is going to be the next big step because it's kind of, I think it's almost more of a black hole than the middle pre-classic is at this point. Even for northern Yucatan, we know more about the middle pre-classic for northern Yucatan now, I think, than we do about the early classic. Ake, notwithstanding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Mm -hmm. Any more questions for Edna? That was good. That was excellent. Thank you. Thank you.